Well, good morning, everyone. Hope you're all doing well this morning. Thank you for joining us as we announce the location of Army Futures Command. It is a new organization that epitomizes our commitment to bold reform and to transforming the Army's modernization process. The creation of Army Futures Command constitutes the Army's most significant reorganization effort since 1973, when the Army created U.S. Army Forces Command and, training and Army Training and Doctrine Command. That reorganization was driven by a realization that the Army, emerging from years of irregular warfare, was ill-prepared to defeat Soviet forces in a high-intensity conflict in Europe. Our equipment, doctrine, and training methods had become outdated. Those reforms resulted in the Big Five combat systems, air land battle doctrine, improved training, including the creation of the National Training Center, and increased professionalism throughout our Army. That transformation created the Army that helped win the Cold War defeated Iraq in the Gulf War, and served our nation well for a generation. Today, the Army once again faces a strategic inflection point. To address these challenges, the National Defense Strategy calls for, quote, a more lethal, resilient, and rapidly innovating force. And last month, in support of the NDS, General Milley and I released the Army vision. Our vision describes the Army of 2028, one that is ready to deploy, fight, and win decisively against any adversary, anytime, anywhere. That Army will employ modern manned and unmanned ground combat vehicles, aircraft, sustainment systems, and weapons, and it will be centered on exceptional leaders and soldiers of unmatched lethality. Army Futures Command will help us achieve this vision. AFC will establish unity of command and unity of effort by consolidating the Army's entire modernization process under one roof. It will turn ideas into actions through experimenting, prototyping, and testing. Most importantly, it will directly incorporate requirements from the warfighter and provide soldiers the weapons and equipment they need when they need them. Army Futures Command can only achieve this in a location that combines top-tier academic institutions, cutting-edge industry, and an innovative private sector with the culture required to fuel our Army's modernization effort. For this reason, the Army will locate Army Futures Command headquarters in Austin, Texas. The Army chose Austin as a location for the AFC headquarters because it not only possessed the talent, the entrepreneurial spirit, and access to key partners we are seeking, but also because it offers the quality of life our people desire and a cost of living they can afford. I'm certain that Austin is the right location for Army Futures Command, yet this selection was a nonetheless a difficult and weighty choice among a number of America's greatest cities. I would like to invite the Under Secretary of Army, Ryan McCarthy, to, the, to uh, walk you through the steps we followed to reach this decision. But before I do that, I want to commend Ryan on his excellent work leading this effort, traveling to each of the cities and coordinating closely with military, <laughs> civic, and private sector leadership. He personally ensured that this process would be both rigorous and fair. And once he's provided you more specifics on the selection process, we'll take your questions. Thank you. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. <clears throat> First, I want to thank each of the cities, Austin, Boston, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Philadelphia and Raleigh-Durham for graciously hosting the Army for two very short notice visits and for the generous amount of time that their leaders gave to us. The state and city elected officials, congressional delegations, private sector entities, university faculty and staff, and countless support staff were all tremendously welcoming and accommodating to our team. It is truly a wonderful reminder of the support the Army has across the nation. As our advanced team briefed their findings from each of the five finalists, We've realized we needed a senior leader to see each of the uh, city for ourselves, to properly evaluate and visualize how the Futures Command headquarters would integrate into each footprint. And I could not be more impressed with the American ingenuity, entrepreneurial spirit, and innovative drive we witnessed in each location. The choice is very difficult, but we ultimately had to make a choice that was best for the U.S. Army. Based on the following criteria, we developed a model with the use of an outside firm validated it through our own internal studies and analysis, as well as a federally funded research and development center, and then narrowed our search to five locations based on the following criteria. Proximity to STEM workers and industries. Proximity to private sector innovation. Academic STEM and R&D investment. Quality of life. Availability costs and time assessment. And assessment of civic support. As we looked at each city, beyond the metrics that drove us to the five places, we envisioned how each city ecosystem would support from our, our modernization effort and priorities vertically, from concept to capability to solution. We do not have time to build this ecosystem. It needed to be ready immediately. 
And in fact, we have a team in route as I speak. Based on that, we determined the city we have the following characteristics. Mature entrepreneurial incubator hubs that give our leaders placement and access to talent, ideas, collaboration, and a willingness to help us build the culture we need. Space and access to a top tier university system science and engineering department where our engineers and collaborative teams can support experiments, prototype concepts and systems. Expandability for other services and companies to join our efforts as we build solutions that meet the concept of how the Army will fight in multi-domain operations. Density of industry and academic talent and the cost of doing business to enable both new startups and to draw established tech firms. Meeting the purpose of the Army Futures Command requires us to move from behind the walls of traditional posts and forts and place ourselves in the middle of an urban center. This is where collaboration, networking, and innovation is happening daily at rates that cannot be duplicated on an Army post or an industrial park. Following the principle of the Allen Curve, shrinking the distance between the Army's workforce and innovators is important to increase communication, drive the change, and bring the speed of our organizational goals to life. Establishing an Army headquarters outside of posts with a diverse mission to interface with industry and academia is a radical cultural change for us. Establishing this headquarters in the city of Austin, Texas will force the Army to lean on American ingenuity and business entrepreneurs to help us through rapid innovation, to challenge our status quo, and to inculcate in ourselves and a collaborative community of people that live to solve complex problems. In closing, as AFC personnel transition to Austin, I want to assure that we keep focus where it has always been, on finding ways to develop cost-efficient, timely, innovative systems that leverage this country's technological expertise and get major weapon systems in formations, as that's the only metric that matters. Rob? Thank you. At this time, we'll go into uh, Q&A, and we'll start with uh, Lita Baldur, Associated Press. Good morning, Lolita Baldur with AP. Um, for either uh, for Esper or McCarthy, um, how much is this going to cost, and what did you get from the city and from the universities to help offset some of the costs as there are donations of buildings, or, or can you outline sort of the package that you got from the city and the state? And for General Milley, um, speaking of the future, the, as you know, there was an insider attack in Afghanistan, and I think this is an important enough subject that, you, that it should be addressed. Um, the SFABs, security personnel, were attacked. Can you talk about what you think may or may not be necessary for changes in the future for the for the SFABs as they continue to get out more um, as, as to uh, train and advise the the uh, Afghans? So, sir, before you start, lead, I, I would just remind you and and the entire group here. We're really here today to talk about Futures Command and that stationing decision. Right. Uh, so we'd like to keep that, on on topic. We don't ever get to see these people well, again. We can sure. take your question and get back to you on that later. Yes, sir. Sir. Uh, Lita, specifically to the command, uh, this is a, uh, the Army is an industrial age process and we're trying to move the information age, so this restructuring uh, is helping us design an Army that can move at the speed of innovation. So um, the, the size of the command and complexity of the command is not a pure apple to apples comparison. Right now we're looking at roughly the same cost as the other major commands. Uh, the other major commands have about 675 personnel in its command group headquarters. The Futures Command is just uh, just slightly below that. We're looking at about 500, but different skill sets, uh, different footprint. Um, leasing property, what, what, uh, what With you respect to, to incentives, incentives were offered by the state of Texas. Uh, we're working through the implementation details right now, and uh, I'm not really in a position that's right now to release that information, but we will shortly. Jennifer Griffin, Fox. Yes. Um, for whoever would okay. like to take this, what message is this sending to China and Russia right now forming this force? Is this a modern day Manhattan project? And I'm afraid I'm going to have to agree with Lita. We don't have an opportunity to see you enough. General Milley, have you reached out to your counterparts in Europe after the NATO summit to reassure them that the U.S. forces are staying? Again, ladies and gentlemen, I'll remind you, we're here today to talk about the station decision for Futures Command. So I'll, I'll take your, your question, Jennifer. Um, this uh, decision is driven by a number of things, not least of which that we recognize that in today's strategic environment, the Army needs to be able to uh, develop ideas, design, uh, test, uh, and then procure and fill it a lot more quickly, quickly than we have in the past and, and a lot better cost. And uh, that is all 
of course, reinforced by the release of the National Defense Strategy uh, earlier this year, and of course, the Chief and I put out the Army vision a couple months ago, or last month. And so we recognize that regardless of who our strategic competitors are, uh, but particularly because we've identified uh, Russia and China, uh, we need to be able to, uh, again, give our soldiers the tools, the weapons, the equipment they need when they need it. And in this day and age, it means a lot more quickly than what we've done in the past. But is there a specific threat from Russia and China that this is addressing? I think what we've done in terms of the process, uh, in terms of the Army's priorities for modernization, there are six of them. What we've looked at is, uh, uh, across those strategic competitors, we've identified particular areas where we need to, where we need to uh, uh, improve our capabilities. So it begins with long-range fires, future vertical lift, next generation combat vehicle, et cetera, all the way down to soldier lethality. So what modernization uh, entails with regard to Army Futures Command will place those where they are, the top six priorities, and then continue to drive those until we are filled with those systems we need. And, and Jennifer, relative to Russia and China, um, I think we all recognize uh, that Russia and China are uh, improving their military capabilities. Uh, and that we have been involved in a war against terrorists, guerrillas, insurgents now for going on 15, 16, 17 years. With respect to the Army, um, what that has meant is that we um, set aside major modernization programs in order to fight the current fight. Uh, as those fights have wound down, uh, we made a conscious decision two, two and a half, almost three years ago now, uh, to maintain readiness for the current fight as our number one priority, which that will maintain, but also to shift gears and re-energize our modernization effort. We analyzed that closely, and we decided we needed to restructure the corporation, so to speak, in order to achieve greater speed, uh, de-layer the organization, uh, in order to reduce bureaucracy, not increase bureaucracy, uh, and in order to get their firstest with the mostest with the best technology available in the hands of the soldiers. That analysis led us to certain gaps, which the Secretary just referred to, and that led us then to our priorities, uh, which long-range precision fires all the way down through soldier lethality. Uh, and that's what this command is designed to do, bring unity of command, speed, relevance of action, uh, and the outputs, the products, the results will be seen in the years to come, but I think it'll be very, very beneficial. Uh, on you and Lolita's other question, I'll be happy to answer those in a different form, be happy to do that. Uh, uh, and, and they're excellent questions, and they're very, very relevant. Uh, but we want to stay focused today on the Futures Command, but I'll be happy to get with you off to the side and give you answers to those questions that you asked. Okay, we'll work our way around the room. Bloomberg? Hi, Roxana Turan with Bloomberg. Um, quick question, how quickly um, are people going to move to Austin, Texas for Futures Command? Um, and, uh, you know, um, how basically how quickly do you expect a relocation? And, and if you could Pro, uh, sort of delve into the cost a little bit more. I mean, you mentioned about 500 people. What estimates are you working with? At this sure, point? I'll, I'll let the again. I'll let the uh, under speak to the mechanics. Um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, we have uh, essentially a beachhead team that is on in route today, and they'll begin working the implementation details associated with establishing the footprint. Uh, with respect to the incentives that were provided. Uh, by the state uh, that they're working through that now so we don't, we don't have ink on the yet but we have the offer on the table um, so we'll be able to release those details later uh, with respect to the cost I had said uh, in the on, uh, roughly on par with the same major commands TRADOC AMC and FORCECOM and how quickly are you expecting to relocate them? when do you see you know the entire command being stood up how quickly are you I think the plane lands in a couple hours so those folks are there now we're getting beginning work now. So with respect to how many people over time, uh, we, we'll establish, uh, and, and we're right now we're what's called initial operating capability, and we're going to work through that structure over the course of this year and a full operational capability by next summer. So we'll ramp the personnel from literally today into next summer and be in the upwards of 500 personnel in the command group. How many people today? I think about a half a dozen. Yeah. We'll move over to Dan Lamoth, Washington Post. Gentlemen, thanks for your time today. If I can just, for one point though, many of the organizations that will move underneath the AFC group are operating today and have been for some time, most notably the cross-functional teams. So it is, in many ways, a matter of rewiring the, uh, the, the organizational structure, but the actual physical movement of people is, as the under outlined, just to be clarified. Sorry, Dan. No problem. Um, 
We often hear that the uh, that the Army in particular and really the, the services across the board are too reliant on the South for recruits and for other things culturally. This was an opportunity to put a pretty high profile command in the Northeast, uh, up near the Canadian border, in Philadelphia, something like that. You went to Texas. Can you speak to why, uh, particularly maybe as it relates to cost of living? Because that sort of sticks out as maybe something that factored in more highly here now that we have an answer. Yeah, I'll speak to the big picture, and then again, I'll let the, the under speak to the, the criteria, because he mo worked most directly on that and, and how we assess things. But look, this is a, uh, a major organizational change, 45 years, and it, it will have important implications for the Army, and we believe it will really do what we're asking it to do, and that is to deliver soldiers the, the tools, weapons, and equipment they need when they need it. So what's important is getting uh, the right place uh, and, 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 and devoid of kind of those other considerations. And uh, the right place was based on some of the criteria that the, the under outlined is where, where is the talent, where is that innovative spirit, where can we be able to best access academia and industry and, and non-traditional industry. And at the same time, you have to have a place that, you, you know, uh, that can accommodate a good quality of life, good cost of living, because uh, these are Army employees. And, and so we have to balance those out. But we didn't go into this saying, oh, well, we need something up here in that part of the country or this part of the country. What we try to do is find the, the best place for the Army, for the mission, for our people. Okay. Yeah, Let's go to Tom in the back of the room there. Actually, this follows up on Dan's question. Uh, sorry. You wanted, did you want to respond, sir? Why don't you ask your question? Okay. Uh, two for one. Dan, I, was, I was thinking in terms of there's been some pushback to the military and generally from places like Google and other private sectors about working with the military. How much of an issue was this uncovered in your search? And to Dan's point, did the Austin uh, opportunity present a lower sort of threat of pushback from the private sector? Of the five cities that I visited and, uh, and that, you know, we started with 150, we necked down to five, uh, it was overwhelming the level of support and the desire that all five of these cities, meant these MSAs, wanted us to be there. And I, and I can't emphasize that enough. So uh, I didn't feel that at all. You know, uh, to, of course. Yes, I do. Oh. Uh, so just from that standpoint, all five of them, went out of their way. They bent over backwards to help us, to get us get help through the, the due diligence to make this, this decision. With respect to the, the specific why it landed, I laid out the six variables. Austin scored the highest. And, you know, all six of them mattered. And, uh, you know, we, it, between, we've started with the two broad categories of academia and business. And uh, some things that we look at is not only the academic STEM and R&D talent associated with the footprint, but also the incubator hubs and uh, the, the entrepreneurial investment in startups uh, was a big part of our decision criteria. So this was data driven. Jeff? Hi, this is a, sorry, Jeff Schobel, task and purpose. This is a question for all of you. I'm not an acquisition reporter, so I'm hoping you can explain in layman's terms how creating a new command will make sure that the problems that ended up killing future combat systems do not recur. I'll, again, I'll speak to the broad, the why, and I'll let the uh, under uh, tackle the second part, uh, and he has some experience in this. Uh, so first of all, one of the challenges we've had um, over the years, and um, uh, this has been chronicled through expert witnesses and testimony and studies, is uh, that we needed to improve accountability and that we needed to achieve uh, greater unity of effort and unity of purpose. Uh, right now, the Army modernization enterprise is spread out over a number of commands and organizations. Uh, you can see it because we are moving parts of those underneath AFC. And so when you have a system that is spread out like that and, and disconnected, uh, you cannot achieve those purposes I spoke to. And so. Uh, what the, what AFC does is promises to deliver those things, and what that means is you now have a single commander in charge of everything from the future force design and concepts all the way through how we spend our RT and e, RDT and E dollars uh, to the uh, to, to the prototyping and testing and soldier involvement into acquisition and then ultimately to fielding. One person now is in charge of uh, delivering all that, so that guarantees a, a, a great deal more speed, a great deal more efficiency in terms of delivery of product and a singularity of focus, in this case on the modernization priorities we outlined earlier, to really, again, deliver what the soldiers need when they need it. Um, I don't add that I was uh, serving in OSD at the time, specifically in Secretary of Defense's office, when I was there when he terminated the program. 
And what you saw, the, the fundamental flaws associated with it was that the operational concept and the technical concepts were not linked. That the clarity of the requirements and what was technologically feasible at the time and how you spiraled that capability in, coupled with the fact that the concepts changed over time. So it continually protracted and, and you lost money. Uh, and then it was difficult to yield or harvest uh, any uh, con content when they terminated the program. So when you, the, the points that the Secretary was making, you, when you have all of the responsibilities associated with weapon systems development, a requirement, an experiment, research and development, prototyping weapon system, then ultimately going out and buying capability, that was spread out, it is spread out across most of the commands in the Army, and include our headquarters of the Department of the Army. So think thousands of people spread all over the place, just emailing each other. So that's why span time of moving information through the system when we established the cross-functional teams last fall, you, bent, you essentially brought the stakeholders together, created formal relationships, fused information faster, and reduced span time to getting decisions, and then cut the number of layers between the information and the leadership. And these cross-functional teams have been reporting to General McConville and I for the last, really since the October timeframe. Uh, and then they will be embedded in the command going forward. So. The, the, really, when you looked at the restructuring, it was a, a simple business case problem. All of the tasks were spread out, and now we're trying to fuse them together. The, the other thing to think about is how you get to the future. You know, o over the, uh, the last 16, 17 years, we've been very, very focused on the presence because we've been in combat-type operations. So as you look to the future, you can incrementally work your way to the future and start from where you're at, or you can have people thinking about the future out in the future, they develop the concepts, they look at the technology, they work side by side, and they come up with the type of material we're going to need to be successful in the future, and then you work your way back, and that's what Futures Command is going to allow us to do. Let me, let me go back a little bit here. The, we're in the midst of a change in the very character of war, um, and we don't and didn't have an organization solely dedicated to that. That's important. Uh, so what we had was TRADOC, Forces Command, and Army Materiel Command. TRADOC principally looked to a lot of the things that we're talking about with AFC, uh, and then AMC did a lot of the other piece with their uh, research development and experimental commands, and they had scientists and labs and so on and so forth. But no, it was spread out, as both secretaries had said, spread out all over the place. Uh, and no one was solely dedicated to looking into the deep future and determine the implications to the United States Army and the conduct of ground combat for this changing character of war that we're coming to grips with. Uh, and we needed to dedicate uh, a single organization to do that and thereby streamline and consolidate and bring unity of command and purpose uh, for the Army uh, to the development of our future capabilities. That's the why. That's the reason. That goes back several years uh, that we've been thinking about this, and now we're bringing it into reality. So uh, it will, I think, uh, our analysis indicates it will avoid a lot of the pitfalls of previous uh, program failures, et cetera. But that's the reason why this is coming into, be, uh, into being right now. Thank you, sir. We'll go to Christina. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for doing this. Um, what what tech and innovation partners uh, will you be working with, or what types of technology um, in in Austin, and and how and this kind of goes back to Dan and Tom's question. How do you plan to overcome some of that skepticism from the tech industry? Do you plan to go to campuses, invite students, you know, on the command? Um, you know, how how will you reach out to the, the broader community and not sort of hunker down or? or let me, let me try and uh, tackle the first part briefly, and then, I'll, again, I'll turn to Secretary McCarthy. Um, the, the chief made a very important point here, and that is the, the character of war is fundamentally changing. And, and I've stated public bef publicly before is whoever gets there first will have un over unmatched lethality on the battlefield for years to come. And so we have some critical technologies out there that are, uh, are essential to fulfilling our six modernization priorities, whether it's directed energy for air and missile defense, whether it's hypersonics for long-range precision fires or whether it's robotics and artificial intelligence uh, for our next generation combat vehicle. So that's why this is so critical to get out there, to get amongst the innovative 
again, the culture of innovation, uh, get among com uh, companies, not just the traditional defense companies, but all companies who are working cutting edge, particularly in these areas, to make sure that we can get there first with this type of uh, equipment, uh, weapon system. So uh, that's, that's why this is so critical, and, and that's why it's called Futures Command, because we are dealing with future, future war fighting. Um, so uh, from a how, we'll have, a, we'll have office space in downtown Austin for our command group, the senior leadership. But we're going to put personnel in incubator hubs. And what was unique about all five of these cities, they all have uh, very established incubator hubs where entrepreneurs, you just walk in the room, there'll be a sea of laptops. And you see them tremoring away. And then over their heads, you'll see a, a GM emblem or Ryan McCarthy Incorporated. And you see out in the, in the economy right now that there's the, the strength of entrepreneurism in these incubator hubs is really challenging big corporations and they're worried about disruption so they're all moving into this we've seen in the defense industry lately the growth of venture capital arms within major defense firms it's showing the strength of the economy and how entrepreneurs are disrupting and this provides us an opportunity to work with them see what's available and help work with them and partner with larger institutions some things i talk about all the time of some of the greatest successes in the department Bantam Car Company that developed a Jeep, partnered with Ford Motor Company, built 600,000 of them during World War II. It's that type of, of solutions that we're trying to drive towards, and uh, we will literally have soldiers and Army civilians right there with them, and they'll have their Army emblem over their laptop. Okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, we have time for a few more questions, so I'm going to take uh, Louie, and then we'll work on ourselves on the other side of the room. Go ahead, Hi, gentlemen. Uh, Louis Martinez with ABC. Uh, thanks again for doing this. Um, in talking about innovation, I think one of the things that is um, common and commonly perceived is that uh, the, the U.S. military is kind of clunky, maybe in its bureaucracy, but it's a little uh, slow to the curve. How do you mesh this uh, this innovation that, because we're t as Secretary McCarthy is talking about? Uh, you're, you're dealing with innovators who are used to moving very quickly. How will you? How do you adjust your culture? Uh, to deal with that so that you can put these weapon systems out into the field faster? Well, we do have to overcome bureaucracy. We do have to improve our processes. Uh, all that is underway. Uh, I, I think what we have to do, part of it is organizational change, and you're seeing that now. Then the next part is the key leaders, people who have, uh, who, who have a reform mindset, uh, persons who look at product over process. And I think we have some key leaders right now uh, on the team that, that view it that way, and I'm confident that the, the first commander of the Army Futures Command will take that approach. So you, you look at the organization, you look at processes, you look at leaders, and over time, as you, as you, as you develop wins, as you get wins, if you will, uh, the culture starts to change. And that is the hardest thing to change, but that's what we're committed to doing. Is, and, and the way you do that, to, to the point that Deander made earlier, and I think we're all making, is partly the way you enable cultural change is to, is to put the organization in an environment where such change, such a culture already exists, where they can help, uh, help drive that cultural change forward, kind of show its merits, its successes, and then help us, again, put those wins on the board. The, um, the culture of the U.S. military, in many ways, writ large, there are exceptions to this, but in many ways, we are an industrial-aged organization. Uh, and our systems are, in many ways, built during a period of time uh, which they are linear and progressive and hierarchical and in some cases stovepipe. This is an attempt by the United States Army to break through that and to bring us into the 21st century in our organizations, our processes, and our leadership, and thereby this organization will help change the culture of the Army itself. There are niche the organizations within the military across all the services that do this already. Uh, this is one to try to change the culture of an entire service in how we approach acquisition, procurement, uh, material, concept development, and, and all of that, the research technology, science and uh, technology, and the research and development for that. Uh, so this is an organizational attempt uh, that will impact leaders, organizations, and processes going to, to try to drive us to man, train, and equip the Army to fight the next war, not the last war. Uh, and this is a very, very important initiative for us. Uh, a, a bit of a red flag caution. Uh, IOC, initial operating capability, is essentially what we're announcing today, the location of the command. Uh, we set 
FOC, full operational capability, for a year from now. It'll take another year. Once the commander is announced, uh, once they've gone through the complete nomination process, to stand this command up, to have all of its processes fleshed out, to have all of the people assigned, and to start seeing some initial results. Uh, what we're doing is we're resetting the institution, the enterprise of the United States Army to produce results, uh, mainly in science, technology, and material, but in other things like concepts, et cetera, uh, in order to set the Army uh, up for future combat. And that's the purpose of the whole thing. The uh, Chief of Staff made an important point, and I, I've said it, uh, and I want to build on it, because I've said this to the Army staff, uh, and I've said this to uh, uh, Congress as, as we've made briefings to them, and I, it's important that I say it to you all. We are at IOC. Things will change over time. Uh, as I've told the Army staff, we have to be comfortable operating in the grave for some amount of time. There may be things we pull into the organization and then later move them back out as we evolve and learn as the uh, AFC commander comes in and, and gets control of his organization. But, but that is part of the culture we're trying to build, is the flexibility to adapt your organization, your processes to the needs at the time. And so even the, the build out, the stand up of the organization itself is going to see that change, that fluidity in it. So what you see, may see today in terms of org charts or whatnot, there may be changes. There, I'm confident there will be changes, uh, big ones, before we get to FOC. And even after FOC, if this organization doesn't um, uh, live, grow, learn, then it's, it's missing something. And that's the culture we're trying to build. I would only add uh, is that the Congress has afforded us a lot of uh, authorities associated with talent management to hiring as well as contractual authorities, and we have to implement these authorities and, and exercise them. So it's, it's um, over the last three years, the, uh, we've been granted a lot of authorities through the committees of jurisdiction, and this is part of this evolution. So we have time for one more question. It's going to go to Corey Dickstein with Stars and Stripes. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, Kind of following up on what General Milley was just saying. Also about your buddy there, huh? To your right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Fox already got a question. Um, we'll follow up. <laughs> uh, do you guys have a commander in mind? Is it fair to say you guys have a there commander, is a in, commander mind? in mind? Uh, we have made a nomination. That nomination is not yet public. It'll be made public at the appropriate time when it's delivered to the Senate Armed Services Committee for confirmation. When do you see having him, him or her, actually in place? Um, and then, uh, have you guys looked any more? The last time you guys were kind of looking at uniforms for civilians, uh, have you guys made any more decisions on, on that kind of makeup? With respect to ratio? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. No. That's a talent-based task issue. I, you know, I would defer to the commander on that. But when do you see having the commander in place? When, when well, we, we hope soon, um, but the, the Senate has to work its will. So uh, obviously as soon as possible. But we do, you know, we, we do have a chain of command uh, still in place, uh, and uh, they'll, they'll be able to uh, be, begin the process of IOC uh, with that team we have and, and start beginning the build-out. So the Army knows how to function when the, when the head guy isn't around, and so uh, we'll continue to move forward. Just want to okay. follow up to Corey. Uh, General Milley. Okay, so I'm sorry, we're going to go into Secretary Esper's closing comments at this point. Well, let me just uh, say thank you all for your time today, your questions. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, very good to talk with you all. As I mentioned earlier, this is the biggest organizational change for the Army since 1973. And, and 1973 brought uh, changes that were, were revolutionary to the service and really uh, uh, made some fantastic improvements. Uh, we're confident that the stand-up of Army Futures Command and its eventual fully operational capability status will really deliver, as we've said a few times, uh, the tools, the weapons, equipment we need, when the soldiers need them to fight and win those future fights. Uh, that's what this is all about. Um, and so I appreciate the hard work that has gone into standing up Army Futures Command and the process of selecting this great city, and I, I couldn't be more pleased with the, the team we have here to make that happen. So we look forward to updating you as uh, AFC continues to evolve, and, uh, and, and we'll do that. But uh, thank you very much for your time today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate your time and the flexibility, uh, given the amount of time that we had today to spend with these Army senior leaders. If you have additional questions, uh, please uh, let us know over at OSDPA, or even better yet, uh, OCPA, or Army Public Affairs, and we'll make sure that you get answers to the questions that you have. Thanks again. Have a good day.